Wow. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, it's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. I'm Dr. Pat. I'm the host of the Dr. Pat Show, Talk Radio to Thrive By. And also, like 10 years ago, created and started with the help of a great team, Transformation Talk Radio and the Transformation Network. You're going to hear lots more about that. I'm here with two of my sidekicks. One of them's, uh, do I call you old school, Benny? No. I'm, you can do that. That's fine. I'm is that, totally is that right of that to go one. old school? Sure, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. You're old school. Olivia's new school. Is that the yeah. way to go? Oh, so it's almost like talking about a tattoo, isn't it? Uh, whoa, I don't know that parallel, but I mean, oh. okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we'll go with oh. that. <laughs> Actually, did you know new school was, is a tattoo form? They are call it new school because it, it I don't want to say deviate, but they use language like it doesn't represent the tri- traditional either tribal art or art. Um, why am I talking about this? It must be connected to the topic today because this is something that I find fascinating with how our consciousness works, how our mindfulness works. And today, uh, thanks to my very special guest, Uh, Mary Angela McGuire, I am here talking about this. It's a question, not whether or not it could, but how, how can, how can mindfulness practices address racism? Yes. Now, the other day, before I introduce my very special guest, The other day, I was doing a show, uh, and I think it was with Laura, Laura Meeks. Laura Meeks, of course, is a radio host here, but she's also a transgender, has a beautiful story about that. And we were talking about how in our own development and and growth in the LGBTQ community, how each of us have said politically correct things, and people look at us like you should know better. But in the world we live in today, in the world where we're looking at what my special featured guest talks about, self-doubt, self-criticism, in that world, whether it's inner dialogue that is expressed in the outer world, you know, when we're looking at, as she would say, the purpose of nothing but now, how do we move beyond the beliefs that would say to us, You shouldn't talk about something because you don't know how to talk about it right. You shouldn't stand up for something because you don't know how to stand up for it right. You shouldn't blah, blah, blah. You fill in the blanks. You shouldn't all over yourself. And what do you have? A big fat zero as you're sheltering in place with a whole lot of stuff inside of you and nowhere to take it. Well, this teacher, mentor, coach knows a lot about this. You know, her professional life, as we know it, is somebody that helps others, the art of listening, clarifying, encouraging. You know, she is a one-on-one coach, but more than that, a speaker and somebody that understands fully that there is a level now of creating voice in what we hear and see. But how does that voice come from a past to show up in nothing but now? to represent the future that we might step into. That's my guest today. Mary Angela, thank you for joining me here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Pratt. I am so excited to be here, as always. Well, I apologize the other day in advance because I made a statement, so did Laura, that we are talking more about, you know, a number of things that we don't generally talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, But I have made these mistakes all of my life. You know, I grew up in generations where there was such things as how we fill jobs and what we do and how we make changes. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about racism and how is racism a habit of mindfulness? Because when you break it down, Mm -hmm. there it is. Right. What's your perspective on it? Well, you know, we are so fortunate in some ways that, um, we're living in a really difficult moment. There is so much suffering out there, but it has brought incredible critical awareness to the work we still have to do in our country around racism. And oftentimes just saying the word uh, white people, those of us who are white have a habit of shutting down, right? It's, uh, it's uncomfortable. We are afraid we're going to make mistakes, 
But my, my perspective is this, um, until we bring conscious awareness to the ways in which most of us who are white have been trained, I think we've often been trained to explicitly be not racist, but implicitly a kind of silent, uh, quiet message that many of us have received throughout our lives is about white racial superiority. And if we ignore that deep training, that, that deep message that's inside of us, we're gonna to continue to operate in the world in a way that probably is pretty, pretty deeply racist. So mindfulness practices, right? If we can start to really understand where our mind goes, what our habits of mind are, then we can notice when, those, uh, when that training is really coming to the forefront. So I think that all of us have an obligation and an opportunity to, uh, to take a deep dive inward, right? To really look inside and say, um, I don't, I, you know, I talk about it on my show, and so I broadcast it in a way, but I don't think everybody has to broadcast it, but it, it's worthwhile for us to say, you know, what were the messages that we grew up with, right? Uh, many of us were, I, you know, grew up in a generation that revered Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Mm -hmm. But I also grew up uh, raised by white people who had lived through very segregated times, who, whether they wanted to or not, they had uh, swallowed a message about white racial superiority that was deeply embedded. I often, if you don't mind me telling a story. Um, so my mother was a nurse. She was born and raised in Baltimore. Baltimore was a very segregated city, but it does have, even then when she was uh, growing up, a large African-American population. She, because she went through nurses training, uh, hospitals were a place where there were African-American employees. And so it wasn't unusual in her life that she crossed paths with black people. That was common. Right. But then she moved in the late fifties to Columbus, Ohio. She went to work as a nurse. She was 27 years old. And she said, she remembers the day that the first time an African-American person addressed her by her first name. She was 27 years old. She had known black people her entire life and they had never addressed her by her first name. The housekeeper my grandmother employed called her Miss. And at 27, my mother realized, what, what, ha what have I been taught about the world? What, you know, I, I talk on my show about limiting beliefs, these deeply held beliefs we have about how the world ought to work. And she realized in that moment that she had been taught that, that she was different and better than one, you know, uh, one step up from um, black people and that they should not address her by her first name. So she was a, an intelligent woman and an empathetic woman and she didn't, she resisted that message immediately, right? She, she appreciated and she accepted that this person, this man spoke to her as an equal, not in terms of their job, but as human beings, they were equals. And he was perfectly free to address her that way. But we don't, you know, we all have to have those kind of moments of consciousness where we say, oh my goodness, what, what's the message that I have internalized? And I didn't even know I'd done it. She didn't even know. My mother, if you asked her at that age, was she racist? I'm sure she would have said no, yeah. right? But the reality was when that opportunity came up and she realized, wow, I have, I have really internalized a message that I don't actually believe in. And so she had work to do. And she knew that. And it was a hard struggle for her. Um, it didn't always come easily. But, but I think all of us can look inside and say, you know, what are those kinds of messages that we have internalized? Um, and how can we bring them to conscious awareness? So that, you know, when we talk about mindfulness, so mindfulness is bringing our full attention to the present moment without judgment, right? So I want to know where my mind is going. I want to know its habits so that I can, uh, I can, Sometimes it means I'm going to sit as my mother did and as I have in my own life with a lot of discomfort, right? I'm going to, it's, it is stressful. It is distressing to notice the kinds of negative messages about white racial superiority that many of us have been taught in our lives. We're going to feel guilt. We're going to feel shame. We're going to feel uncomfortable. And, and that's okay because, you know, feelings pass. Everything passes, right? Life is change. I heard yeah. your previous guest talking about that. That's the only yeah. constant, right? Is change. And so, um, but but to me, it's far better to engage in that practice of mindfulness, of accepting that reality, of noticing 
those beliefs that I have that are deeply held of letting the negative feelings that are inevitably going to come up as a result, to sit with them, to come to terms with them, to let them pass through me so that I don't just uh, turn away, stuff those feelings down or become highly reactive. And I think that, you know, that is the real problem. And if we fail at mindfulness in, in addressing our deeply held beliefs about racial superiority, then we're going to be reactive. We're going to act out of those beliefs in ways that shame us, embarrass us, and make us uh, regret our actions sometimes. Um, so that's kind of my... Yeah, of and it's a powerful one. Um, and one of the things that I want to talk about when we come back from mm -hmm. break is, you know, it's so interesting do you ever get in a place, uh, Mary Angela, ever you get in a place, you ever get in a place where something happens in the world or something and we get a flashback mm -hmm. and then somebody asks us a question immediately the, uh, thereafter. And, you know, the question, so people have been listening to a couple of shows I've done where I've talked about my stepmom mm -hmm. and how she raised us. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that I am the only one of my family that you know, uh, on the Basili side, you know, my sister, my sister's kid, I'm the only one not interracially married, not mm -hmm. marrying somebody of, col of color, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not married. Right. Um, but the question came up the other day and I shared a story about my coach mm -hmm. and I hadn't thought about that. Um, I'm thinking about things or I'm remembering things that go way back. Right. And what I want to talk with you about when we come back mm -hmm. is a practice and a training that dominated, I'd say, the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. And if you were in corporate America or a corporation like the phone company, uh -huh. Jessica's like, oh, my God, did you say the word phone? But it was called the phone company, uh -huh. AT&T right. Bell Labs. Yeah. If you were one of the lucky ones like I was or when most people heard that they were being sent to this training, mm -hmm. went on jury duty instead of going to this training. Yikes. It was a level of what we know as sensitivity training. Uh. And it was done by a gentleman called Lee Harvey. Mm -hmm. And I went on to study how to do it years later, trained in it. But it is the kind of training that we don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. It gets at the beliefs. Right. When we come back, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about those beliefs. Great. We're going to talk about the superiority of mindfulness that does happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not really called mindfulness, but it could be. And how do we uncover those beliefs, mm -hmm. keep the sense of who we are and acknowledge we have to perhaps change them. You're going to talk about all of that cool stuff. <laughs> Let's take a okay. short break, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. You know, awakening happens at many, many levels. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking during the last show about, you know, my view of awakening and what's happening. Today, we're talking about with my very special guest, uh, Mary Angela McGuire. We're going to find out in a minute. But really, how can mindfulness practices address racism? We're going to take a deep dive, by the way, into what mindfulness is and isn't. But before we do, can we take a moment, tell people about your show? Sure. Uh, and then we'll talk more about it later uh, here in the hour. But how do people find out about you? You're a phenomenal coach. How do they get information about all of that? Well, the show is uh, Thursdays at noon on Transformation Talk Radio. It's called Nothing But Now. And uh, so that's noon Pacific time. And uh, also people can just go to my website, which is McGuire Life Coach. And people can contact me through the website to find out more about my coaching practice. But they can learn quite a bit about it from the website also, from my blog, which is also called Nothing But Now. And um, just emailing me at maryangelamcguire at gmail.com. Uh, I like to work with pe people often come to me because they feel stuck and uh, you know, we can get stuck in our lives in so many different ways. And often it first presents itself for folks as challenges at work and feeling stuck in place at work. But what we find through our conversations is the kinds of limiting beliefs we've been talking about, whether it's about racism or about 
what's a good wife or what's a good dad, all those kinds of deeply held beliefs we have, bringing them to conscious awareness, investigating them, saying, you know, what role is that belief playing in your life? Is it helping you? Is it getting in your way? Is it the cause of the stuckness? So it's kind of an inquiry process, uh, mostly about me listening and uh, clients talking uh, so that they can find a way forward. And then using mindfulness practices so that they can become more aware of what are their habits of mind? Where does their mind go? And, and where do those, how do those pathways also cause tra- challenges and problems and how can you create new pathways yeah. right mindful pathways so that you are uh, more awake uh, and uh, alert to the world around you and the moment in which you are uh, living i i'm i'm telling you that you know the work that you do and this is what i like to talk about the work that you do and helping people avoid the potholes right. i think it's one of the most important bodies of work we can do today Because the world we're living in today is happening so fast that people have already lost their rear axle in a pothole that they didn't even see coming. That's a little car metaphor. (laughs) Um, But what we're talking about today Mm -hmm. is not just a pothole. This is like a major volcano of canines. This is so let Mm -hmm. me ask you this. Mm -hmm. How these deep beliefs, right, Mm -hmm. about racial superiority? And Mm -hmm. let's talk about what that means. Mm -hmm. How do we use mindfulness to uncover those and then address them? Now, many people would be probably taking a deep breath right now Mm -hmm. because I said racial superiority. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many workshops I've been in, how many I've taught, Mm -hmm. where the minute I say anything like that, the case is that's not me. Right, absolutely. Um, I think it's a a rare person in our culture, a white person who is proud of being a racist, right? I mean, we we think of that as a very narrow segment of the population. There are people like that, but very few people would say that about themselves. So what do we typically say instead? I don't see color. I treat everyone the same. I don't have, I'm not a racist. But I think, you know, one of the most important things that's happening in the current conversation about this is what's the difference between saying I'm not a racist versus I'm engaged in anti-racist activities, right? I'm, which to me is the kind of mindful practice. It's not just saying I'm, I don't notice race, I don't see color, which I think that's a, a, a very limited way to look at the world and not very helpful versus I am, I am thinking hard about these things. I'm educating myself. I'm bringing my... Um, whole self into this moment to say, who am I? What do I believe, et cetera, so that I can be conscious and conscientious in my interactions with other people. Um, The kind of, I don't see it, I don't notice it, I think is a kind of mindlessness. And it's, and I think it comes from, you know, I want to address a person who who says that with kindness and compassion. I think it's, it's scary to imagine that we have deeply held racist beliefs. It's, a way of um, denigrating our family of origin, right? To say that we were raised up with those kinds of beliefs. It's very uncomfortable. It reminds us that we may do and say things that are hurtful and unkind and upsetting to another person. And you know, if we don't see ourselves that way, that can be very troubling. But to push it aside and to just use those kind of quick, I don't see race, I treat everybody the same, is very, very unhelpful because it means that we're probably lost in a kind of reactivity as opposed to a kind of a conscious, wakeful uh, way of being in the world. And we want to be careful about that. We really um, need to be careful about you know, that. Yeah. And, you know, what, what you're talking about is, um, you know, I ran into the same thing um, mm-hmm. not too long ago, but definitely throughout my life where racism is is a word that has come to mean a lot of things to a lot of people without an accurate meaning Mm. and recently on the on some news i can't remember exactly they went around and they asked different political leadership Mm -hmm. do you believe there's systemic racism do you believe there's systemic racism do you believe in systemic racism And I watched a number of these people um, who were, none of which were of color. Okay. Not, 
they were white people. Okay. <laughs> Right. And the interviews I saw were white men, but mm -hmm. I think there was, you know, there are others. And their answer was no. Mm -hmm. And what that held for me was a different perspective on the gap. Right. What I call the gap. And so we're talking about this is a belief mm -hmm. of a lawmaker, right? right. Mm -hmm. And a body of lawmakers that control the vote in our country in right. terms of laws and things. This is that group. Mm -hmm. And I thought, might there have been a different question asked hmm. of these people or a follow-up? Right. right. And then I asked, why? Why would we have to come up with a different question for a lawmaker? <laughs> but I want to ask you about that because mm -hmm. this was a belief question, I think, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, you have to think about how are most of us black, white, Asian, indigenous populations, people of color in general, how are we educated about our country? You know, I think most of us are taught in school that there was slavery, there were enslaved people, there was a civil war, slavery was outlawed, case closed, right? So that anything that happened since then is the responsibility of the individuals involved. And if we, if our knowledge stops there, we say, oh, there was, yes, there was slavery, then there was a war, it ended, therefore slavery ended, case closed, then we, then we don't know a lot of facts about history. And, but you don't have to go back very far. You can look at contemporary studies, particularly in things like economics and sociology. You know, the, the research that shows that two people with exactly the same resume, uh, not one uh, systematically being discriminated against because their name is perceived as black, that that's it. research is very current. It still happens today. Uh, the discrimination in housing still happens today. So, and those two things are extremely important. If you think about, if you want everybody to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, right? Then they have to have equal access to things like jobs and housing in order to do that. So when we say there is no systemic racism, we're speaking really from a denial of reality and from research that shows us it's quite prevalent and it's happening all around us. So I think as whites, we often want to say, you know, I, whatever I have, I've, I've earned for myself. And if you don't have what I have, it's because you didn't earn it. Right. And that that keeps us in a kind of safe and comfortable position, unfortunately. And it, it keeps us from really understanding our place in culture. And I was, you know, I used to teach communication and gender classes. And so we talked a lot about sexism. And that's a very comfortable subject for me compared to racism. But um, <laughs> students would say, you know, I didn't I didn't create this structure of sex and gender stereotypes. Right. So how can I be responsible for it? And I think as whites, we often feel the same way. I didn't create yeah. th these social structures that yeah. create systemic racism. So why am I responsible? Why do I have to do anything about it? Why do I have to do a deep dive into my own beliefs? Well, because we, we're Americans and we want to live in a, we say we want to live in a, in a just society, right? And so therefore, uh, each of us as individuals we do, we are reproducing those cultural structures all of the time, right? If, if I'm a clerk in a store and I'm white and I, out of habit, follow the black people who come into the store and I assume that they are uh, coming in with bad intent, then, then I'm participating in systemic racism. You know, there's been the articles recently, of really upsetting articles about national banks where a black person who has an account at the bank goes in to cash a check and takes all kinds of guff and can't cash the check and is treated very badly. I mean, this is that's the kind of racial profiling. So it's happening and in these interaction, these micro interactions all the time. And, and I think to me, this is the other thing that's really critical about this. As a white person, I don't necessarily have to engage around racism at all. I can completely withdraw from the issue. Black, indigenous, people of color in our culture do not have that option. Right. Right. They can't opt out. Right. So I, as a, I just want to, and I don't mean this in a self-righteous way at all. Um, I think we all come to this at our own speed and our own time. But to the extent that I'm awake, I want to say, okay, what can I do? What can I do to combat this? How can I not just be not racist, but an anti-racist?
Yeah. And, you know, this is one of the thing, these things I'm getting a, um, I'm getting, a, what, do you, what do you call that? Memory. I'm getting an instant yes. memory recall uh-huh. because I, I, I remember who I was when I was in my 20s and 30s. And, you know, I'm remembering situations that I would never stand for back then and didn't understand. Like when my coach and I got pulled over to the side of the road. And the next thing I know, he's in handcuffs and I'm getting ready to be put in handcuffs. You know why? Because now now we know why. I mean, this black man who was my coach uh, was a black man in a car with a young white woman. And right. here we are going to a tournament and they didn't believe us. Right. And, you know, I said, it, can't, it, it sounds a little odd, though. You know, we're just going to a table tennis tournament. Like, I mean, right? Like we're on a road in Philadelphia. Right. We're going to, we're just going to play in a tournament, table tennis tournament. You know, he's my coach. Right. And, you know, somehow you pray for what to say. And I said, open up the trunk. You'll oh. see our stuff. Right. Open up the trunk. But yet there have been three times in my life where I've really been afraid. Mm-hmm. where the level of fear is so overwhelming. I can't even describe it. Mm-hmm. And what we now know and what I now know on reflecting on that memory is this is what people of color, black people have gone through and go through their entire night. That one brief moment I had with Sam, Right. that one brief moment, mm-hmm. you know, and Sam's comment to me, Mm -hmm. then didn't really hold what it holds today. Mm -hmm. He says, I go, this is every day for me. Oh my goodness. Let's take a short break when we come back. Okay. Why is it that these memories, these things that we are now remembering, and I have a bunch of them that are coming to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Why is it calling us, both of us today on the show, Uh to do something different, Mm -hmm. a new direction? What is that about? I want to know. I want to know what Mary Angela. I want to know. I want to know which what she came up with, and I come up with. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yep, Dr. Mary Angela McGuire joining me here today. Look, before we kind of continue here because we're going to roll right up to the top. Okay. Um, one more time to let folks know, not sure. just about how to find you, but your show, about your blog, all of the above. Okay. So I am on Thursdays at noon Pacific time, nothing but now, where we talk about mindfulness practices. And um, my website is McGuire Life Coach. I work individually with clients to help them get unstuck and to do a kind of inquiry process to help them understand where their mind goes, what their habits of mind are, uh, so that they can get unstuck. I also uh, work specifically with people on communication issues, both groups and individuals, because that's my background, is uh, in communication studies. And um, so you can also find my blog, which is called Nothing But Now, or my website, mcguirelifecoach.com, and you can contact me through the website. Wow, thank you so much for that. Um, A lot of times we don't hear these two words in the same sentence. So let's just remind everybody what we're talking about today. Um, How can mindfulness practices adjust race, address racism? Mm -hmm. Um, And we talked about a number of things today, but then there's the last thing, which I like to talk about, and that's action. It's kind of like, that's a great memory for you to have, Pat, but what are you doing today about it? Right. You know, what is it that you're not doing? that you can do because you can do it. Right. And that has gotten me to think about it. Has it gotten you to think? It has. It, it really has. You know, the one of the things I think has been so interesting in the present moment, if you go on Facebook or any number of venues, magazines and newspapers, et cetera, suddenly we're seeing all of these um, reading lists or movie lists or ways in which we can educate ourselves. And I think I think this is not only important in the sense that we all need to be as well educated as we can about the life experiences of people who are different from us, but who are our neighbors and uh, relatives, etc. But we need to think about how our racism, if we're white, is fueled by our imagination. 
and the limits of our imagination, right? I grew up in a white neighborhood. I went to a white school. I didn't have friends who were people of color until I was in college and more likely in graduate school and even more once I became a professional. So um, what were the limits of my imagination around people's the experience of black, indigenous and people of color, right? Well, it was limited by the movies I watched, it was limited by uh, who do we see in public culture, athletes, celebrities, musicians, a few politicians, right? Uh, and the news that heightens our sense of fear and anxiety and even television shows, if you think about it, there's so much crime in our television shows and in our popular novels. So we have a lot of fear in our imaginations. A lot of it reinforces um, negative stereotypes about black indigenous and people of color. And so I wanna think about what am I, how am I fueling my imagination in better ways? So certainly there are all sorts of ways that, that we can Im uh, improve what the, the contents of our mind in a way. Um, I, I'm just gonna recommend a couple of books because I think they, because they've had a very positive impact on me. Um, one is uh, a book by Isabel Wilkerson called The Warmth of Other Suns. And um, it is a book that really helps us understand what's called the Great Migration or the movement of large numbers of African-American people from the South to the North. Um, it wasn't an easy process. It wasn't a joyful process in many respects. It was very difficult and painful. And I think if, if you're a white person like me who was educated to believe that racism ended when the Civil War ended, um, this is an awakening book mm. to say, here's the reality that connects that time to the current, to the present day. And so I think that's one way to fuel our imaginations differently. But I have this forum, which is this show I have uh, on Thursdays at noon on Transformation Talk Radio called Nothing But Now. And it finally, as I was thinking through, and I know you've been thinking about this too, this question of what can I do? So I wondered how can I raise up voices that we don't hear, right? Um, I've been very privileged in the course of my adult life in particular to um, work with people of color, to have students who are people of color, to uh, be in volunteer organizations where I met people of other races. And um, so I have reached out to a number of them and said, would you come on my show? Would you let me interview you? And would you tell us about family history? your own life journey, your career choices. Uh, what are those social or political or religious commitments that are important to you? What's a message you would wanna share uh, to, uh, with other people? Um, these are not famous people. These are people who are just like me. They're just regular folks. And I think um, the, one of the reasons I'm doing it, of course, is to fuel people's imagination, white listeners' imagination to say, here are voices you probably haven't heard before because they're not necessarily out there in the public arena. Um, to For um, listeners who are people of color to say, here are stories you're gonna recognize and relate to, but maybe you don't often hear them in a public forum. Um, and if my guests wanna talk about racism, that's great, but they're not, I'm not asking them to come on to educate us. I'm not asking them to come on to take a political stand, but simply to tell their stories. And, and because this is the thing that has had a big impact on me in terms of my own empathy for the experience. You know, you and I were talking about uh, before the break about your experience with your coach when the two of you were pulled over. Yeah. And he said to, you know, this is, this is a common experience for me, Pat, this isn't unusual. And I think about the psychic energy it takes to be black in America, right? The incredible burden of the psychic energy it takes to be going about your day just doing your thing, living your life, and never knowing when your race is going to come to somebody else's attention. You know, as white people, we often complain about, oh, why do pe black people talk about race so much? <laughs> I don't know that, I don't think they have any particular desire to talk about it. I think it is foisted upon them over and over again in all of these small and large ways, whether it's the microaggression of the person who says, can I touch your hair, uh, to the systemic racism of discrimination in housing and employment. It's pervasive in their lives, and yet people are whole and they are living beautiful lives, but we don't see very much of that in our popular culture about just regular folks and their regular lives. Um, so I think to build uh, empathy and understanding, I think that's something I can do with the show. And, you know, this is really what I was talking about before, because, you know, you and I both have places where we have tools and resources available right. to us. 
And, you know, myself, Linda and Jessica are looking at that now. And, you know, as our new tech get, winds up and is getting finished here, we're looking at and prioritizing what we need to do differently with the network. But for me, I already have a venue in Power Up with Dr. Great. Pat. Great. And, and so isn't it interesting we are starting to really ask ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, what is it I can do more of? Right. Um, and, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and this came up and, and I actually did half a show about it. Mm -hmm. They asked this question. I said to them, you know, hey, blah, blah, blah. You know, what's it going to take for you to do a show? I mean, you're very passionate. Mm -hmm. you've been in the protest you you know and I, and I and her answer was so shocking and yet so right on mm -hmm. and she said I'm afraid of making a mistake mm. I'm afraid of making a mistake and then I got it because I've I've watched some of the television shows right and I watch some of the um hosts really tiptoe around mm -hmm. asking people of color, not just black people, but Asian mm -hmm. people, indigenous right. people of color, period. People that's not like them. Right. Uh, LGBTQ, uh, just stumble and fumble on questions mm -hmm. and what to ask. Mm -hmm. and, and I get it because that's what she was saying. Mm -hmm. She's saying, I don't think I'll ever be honest enough to ask them the questions that's on my mind mm. because I'm just afraid of saying the wrong thing. Right. And that's not unusual. Right. What do we say to folks about that? Well, I do think that's where this kind of deep dive into our own experience of racism and our own limiting beliefs about it is really important because, you know, I don't want to make it the responsibility of a person of color to correct me, to be kind to me when I make a mistake, to gently redirect me. I mean, that's great if that happens, but I think my first responsibility is to educate myself, not only about the world, but about myself, right? Where are those sticking places for me where I still harbor those feelings of white superiority? So that's, I think, the first thing. I also think that the mindfulness practices, when we have an open heart and a compassion for ourselves, we inevitably bring our, an open heart and compassion towards others. And people know the difference. I think people recognize when they are being addressed sincerely, um, not in a pleading way, not in an asking for absolution way, but when, they, when a person comes to them with an open heart with kindness, with a lack of judgment, and, and, and simply asks a question um, without sort of making it the other person's responsibility. I think people know the difference. I pe think people respect the difference. Um, and, and, it, and, and yet it will be a risk, right? I, I talk to clients about this all the time who in other contexts, you know, they have jobs with a lot of responsibility. And to a certain extent, it doesn't matter what we do. There's, somebody's gonna find a reason to criticize, right? There yeah. Right. So at a certain point, I just have to say, and I felt, I feel like the shows that I'm planning to do these interviews, I feel like it's a risk, right? I think um, people could say that's exploitive. That's uh, not your lane, that sort of thing. Um, I understand that people are welcome to criticize, but um, my friends have responded uh, happily and enthusiastically. Wow. And I think it's because they recognize my sincerity and that uh, an open heart you know, I come to them with an open heart and I think they respond in kind. Yeah. I mean, you know, this conversation I had with this person, I'm so mm -hmm. thrilled to hear this about what you're doing. And certainly we want to know more about this because we'd really like to support you in this. But it reminds me of, of a situation which is not quite a, a, the same feeling, but my friend went on to say, do you remember, Pat, when you know, we were out there and we're, you know, walking the streets and we're doing petitions for gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And then she said, do you remember when it went from being gay marriage to same sex? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, then it went from that to something else. And she said, do you remember 
how it was for people trying to talk with us about it. Right. Um, and do you remember what our response was? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I remember some of it. You mm -hmm. know, most of the time we just, we laughed. Right. And we joked about it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really a joke. You no. know, gaining that right wasn't a joke. No, not at all. But when you're watching your friend stumble whether or not to call you husband, wife, partner, right. yes. I, I mean, and it's really fascinating to watch mm -hmm. um, and be part of. But mm -hmm. there's a response and then there is a response. And right. I was watching an interview the other day by Asia Kate Dillon. Mm -hmm. who really blew the doors off of mm -hmm. gender conversations. She's gender neutral. He, mm -hmm. They are gender neutral. They, there I went, they are gender yeah. neutral. American actor, clearly. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to know what the meaning is of their tattoo. Uh -huh. uh, on, and I was one of them, but I Googled it. And it's a word, <laughs> it, it's empathy. It means empathy, this German tattoo. Oh, wonderful. But I thought to my friend, I said, you know, I think you're kind of right with that, mm -hmm. but you might not be. And I said, think about now that conversation and you are now a person of color mm -hmm. and you're so frustrated with the whole thing. You pretty much are trying to say, I don't want to be called any of it. Right. Here's what you call me. Mm -hmm. But this is the thing that I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. You're doing this new show. I'm going to be doing it. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to know what the rules of the game are. Right. And what I say to people is you're not going to know. And it's okay because you got to get in the game. Right. And, you know, it's okay to apologize when we make mistakes. <laughs> it's okay to say, oh, I had no idea. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Um, I had a similar experience as you with a, uh, in a group situation with a, a non-gender binary person. And wow, did I struggle, right? <laughs> All that training about, you know, they is not a singular pronoun, blah, 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 right? It's hard. And, she, and he, they, see, they yep. were so gracious, as well as other young people in the group who reminded me at times because I kept failing. Um, and they, I think they thought I was not, I was not being dismissive of the situation. And I think that's another thing. Sometimes when we make mistakes, we just shut down, right? We get so anxious and so embarrassed, right? And we shut down and then we look like we don't care yeah. or that we don't think it's important. Yeah. Right? So again, it's one of those places if I can have compassion for myself, I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to have a bit more compassion towards you and you're going to repay me with compassion. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard for me to not realize that the events of these past weeks and months mm -hmm. have had me look reflectively at so many things. Let me give you a, a specific example. Um, I used to be a huge advocate um, out there about natural health and how natural health was out in the forefront of curing things like Lyme disease, way ahead of the curve, even today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, COVID-19. I have uh -huh. two people that went to my naturopath. They did. They they had the virus wow. and they were cured of the virus. And without some of the complications we're talking about, right? right. Um, but we're not talking about that, right? We're not talking about it. So what's happening is these things we're not talking about seem to want to give us a bypass. I call it a spiritual bypass because the soul is giving us the ability to talk about it. And I want to ask you this question too. You know, what are the events? How would you capture how these events have changed you? I know your show is one of them, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering what else might be going on in your thinking and in your heart. Well, I think um, I've certainly wondered about what activism means to me. Um, and it's difficult yeah. in this particular moment because of COVID. Yeah. Um, I'm not free to put myself and my family at risk. Yeah. And that is very challenging. Um, it's asked me to think hard about 
um, sort of, you know, being a checkbook liberal kind of person, right? A person who writes a check to a cause. I think that's important, but gosh, that's become very complicated too. Um, so it has definitely pushed me to think harder about what uh, kind of a bubble I live in, to be honest, right? And whether or not I live in that bubble. And um, and and it has also, you know, I, I didn't used to be on Facebook, right? I wasn't on Facebook until about a month ago when I started doing the show. <laughs> and um, I got on Facebook and for all of its problems, and I don't want to get, talk about the politics of Facebook because there are clear problems there, but in terms of my own experience of it, suddenly I have access to and connections with people that I've known for very, many, many years, but have not really been engaged with. And to see their activism, to see us exchanging great articles we've read and great uh, resources for anti-racist work, and to see these 200 people yeah. that I happen to know, all it seems engaged in these conversations actually has been very heartening. And it's a fairly diverse group of people. And so it's, um, uh, that's very heartening too. And it reminded me uh, how, much, how much diversity there has been in my life and what, what can I do to ask more questions? What can I do to, be, uh, to raise up some voices? Um, so that's been the, the biggest thing for me is to really say, what can I do to put more on the line and, and put a little bit more at risk too? Yeah, right? I, I think that's been the biggest question for me. And um, and then I had to ask myself the question, maybe, maybe I'll have to talk to you and work with you on this one, is when did I become so risk averse? Right. I'm not, I'm unusual. When I say, when did I become so risk averse? I mean, on a scale of one to 10, Right. You know, the level of risk that I'm used to taking, not that the average person takes, but that mm -hmm. I'm personally used to taking. Right. When did I become shy about that? Mm -hmm. But we have to admit, both of us, it's like we're getting our mojo back. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it ever left us. Right. Oh, maybe it went on sabbatical or something. <laughs> I think mine did for sure. A little sabbatical. <laughs> but we're really wanting to get our mojo back, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're yes. going to be really interesting to follow and <laughs> to watch um, because I've gotten to know you. And I know when something strikes you, mm -hmm. you're all in. Yes. You're all in. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be exciting to watch. Thank you so much for joining me today. Let folks know about your show again, how to contact you. And then what's your personal message? What would you like to leave us with today? Well, you can contact me at uh, mcguirelifecoach.com. You can listen to my show on Thursdays at noon Pacific time. It's called Nothing But Now. And that's the same name as my blog. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. Um, I think, and uh, we're going to start the interviews on July 9th. That'll be the first one. So we'll probably pretty much every other week, uh, we'll do an interview show. And then the weeks in between will be more the traditional kind of traditional mindfulness practices that I've been talking about for the last few weeks. Um, I, you know, I think this conversation we're having about risk is very important. Um, and to say, to, to put ourselves out there, we talk a lot now about cancel culture and I, I think we just have to try as best we can to understand ourselves, to know where we're coming from, to treat ourselves with compassion, to treat others with compassion. And in doing that, I think we will be able to, you know, to be open to the world, to the, in the moment we're in is a risk. And so uh, Glennon Doyle says, we can do hard things. And I think that's a great message too. I keep no telling kidding. myself that we can do hard things. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah, we can do hard things. And yeah. my my mama used to say is, yeah, you, you're going to get some hard stuff in your life, girl. And yeah. I would say, like, what do you mean? But she said, you know what? Don't ever quit. Right. Thank, Thank you for you. joining me here today. Thank you. All right. Don't forget, tune in. Great show. Nothing but now. Because the truth is, there is nothing but now. That's right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning us in. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a short break. More coming back on TransformationTalkRadio.com. We'll be right back.